Hey, my name is Mike, and after saving money for a couple of years, it was time for me to buy a new computer. This video goes over all of my parts, the building, the overclocking, and then all the stuff happening outside of my case, like my cable management, the LED strips, and then finally a room tour, because why not? Obviously, this is a pretty long video, so I put some timestamps in the description box. I'm really excited about this entire experience, so I just wanted to make a video about it. I've never built a computer before. My brother built my old computer with parts I just randomly selected. For this new computer, I spent multiple days researching each part, making sure there was no compatibility issues, and making sure that I was getting one of, if not the best product out there so I could future-proof my computer as best as possible. Originally, my brother was going to build this computer for me, but after researching for so long, I got really excited and I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to be able to say that I built my own computer. Computer. So this is my old setup, a computer I got in like 2011 that has been blue screening on me at least once a week. The graphics card died on me this past summer so I've been using a $100 GTX 1030 in its place. There's no cable management inside or outside of my computer and I've probably wanted to upgrade since about late 2015. So what did I upgrade to? The case I got is a Thermaltake Core V71 full tower case. It wasn't my first option, there were a few other ones that I actually liked a lot more like the H500P from Cooler Master or the RGB version of this case. But the reviews for the other options just weren't really sitting well with me. The unfortunate thing too is that there wasn't that much variety in terms of full tower cases, at least not from the selection of the ones that I liked. I knew I wanted a full tower just to have as much room as possible to work with, but also to have room for liquid cooling should I go that route in the future. I ended up coming across this case and I didn't think it looked terrible, but it looked pretty bland to me. The version of this case that I was looking at had a very ugly blue plastic attached to all the hard drive bays, which was initially enough to make me say no right away. But when I couldn't find anything else, I ended up coming back to this one and decided I could handle the blue plastic, which I still thought was ugly. But I ended up accidentally ordering a different model somehow that came in without the blue plastic at all, which was a very pleasant surprise. But the reviews for this case are great. There's plenty of space, great airflow, dust filters, removable front and top panels. After a few hours looking through every case I could find, I decided that this one was the best reviewed and also didn't look like complete crap. Initially, I wasn't a big fan of the blue lights on the front of the case and was actually going to swap these out with RGB fans. But the more I look at it now, the more I just fall in love with the blue. I, I think I'll, I think I'm going to leave it. The motherboard is an ASRock Fatality Z370 Gaming K6. I don't think this motherboard benched amazingly, but it was definitely good. The reviews for it were pretty positive. Overall, what ended up selling me on this was that the reviews mentioned the UEFI being very user-friendly and noob accommodating. That's probably not the best thing to base a purchase on, but as a newbie, this was definitely great for me. After having used this motherboard for about a month and overclocking, I can say that the overall experience was fine. I don't know too much about overclocking, but I didn't really like the settings that this motherboard had for overclocking. There's no way that I can manually set my voltage Voltage, it's either offset or automatic, which is just annoying. Of course, with that motherboard, I got an 8700K. There wasn't a lot of thought or research that went into this, it's just the latest and greatest. Overall, it's a great CPU. For some reason, Sony Vegas can't edit or render videos with any sort of overclock on the CPU, which is kind of annoying. I don't know if that's a CPU, a motherboard, or a Vegas issue, but I'm leaning more towards Vegas. The CPU cooler is something that I researched for probably six or more hours, which I was not expecting. I considered air cooling for a minute, but my brother said that if I'm overclocking, I may as well just get a CLC. It didn't take that much convincing, and I like the look a lot better too. A lot of the CLCs out there though have pretty poor reviews. I mean, they could all cool the CPU pretty well, but almost every single CLC was dying within a year and I was getting very discouraged. The tubing was also very stiff on a lot of them, which was actually contributing to them failing. So when the EVGA CLC 280 came up, I was very intrigued that there was, I think, like one review that mentioned failure. I did some meticulous research on it and I ended up thinking it was probably the most reliable one I was going to find. One thing I'm not a big fan of is the shape of the fan casing. Jay's Two Cents has a great video about how there's a lot of kickback with this design. It doesn't end up actually being that big of a deal, but I would have liked to have that not be an issue at all. Having now used it, I think it does its job well. It looks nice. Setting it up was a bit of a pain in the ass, which I'll cover later on, but I think that was more of an issue with my case. For memory, I got four G-Skill Trident Z 8GB sticks, DDR4, 3200, CIS latency of 14. I didn't do too much research, I kinda just found a few companies I've heard of, read through the first couple of pages of reviews, and then went on some YouTube videos and found that the Trident Zs were pretty much common for most builds nowadays. I heavily considered getting the RGB version of this RAM, but I couldn't justify spending $100, especially given the price tag I was already paying. However, my brother has the RGB RAM, and my friend now has the RGB RAM, and I can say with 100% confidence that I made a grave mistake. I definitely should have got the RGB sticks. The GPU I settled on was an ASUS ROG Strix 1080 Ti Overclocked Edition, and it actually wasn't my first choice. I know this card on, I think, all benchmarks rank not only the quietest, but also the coolest temperature-wise. However, the EVGA FTW3 card was actually benchmarking higher in terms of performance, despite not being as cool or as quiet. And I mean, the difference is ridiculous. It's a first world problem. It's 120 FPS versus 117. So I bought the FTW3 for about $1,000, which is kind of insane considering the prices now. And 
and I bought it on December 26, 2017. Two weeks go by and it's still out of stock everywhere. At this point, there was only a couple days until the last parts I needed were coming in. I didn't want to wait forever for this GPU, so I started looking up 1080 Ti's again, and to my surprise, the ASUS card was available. So I started reading reviews again. Somehow in my original research, I had missed that the EVGA card has asynchronous fans, meaning that the three fans do not spin at the same time or at the same RPM. So in uncovering this, I found a few threads dedicated to talking about how annoying this was, especially trying to get the fans to sync up. You can attempt to do it in EVGA software, but apparently that was an entirely different issue on its own. So with this newfound knowledge, I immediately canceled my EVGA order and ordered the ASUS card. With priority shipping, it arrived in two days. Overall, this GPU is amazing. I have no complaints about it. I did some VR benchmarks in superposition with the future setting using 3GB of my 11GB of VRAM and just laughed that I was getting something like 40 FPS still. For storage, I moved two of my hard drives over from my old computer. There's a 4TB 7200 RPM hard drive that I use for all of my YouTube footage, as well as a 1TB 10K RPM hard drive that I'm just using for random storage. For new storage though, I bought a 250GB Samsung 960 EO M.2. I was considering a larger M.2, but the prices are just insane, so I figured I'd install Windows 10 on this drive, along with all my applications like browsers, voice comms, benchmarks, and so on. I still cannot believe this small piece of hardware is a hard drive. I actually laughed when I took it out of the box and saw it for the first time. When I got my old computer, I don't think M.2s existed. I know I've seen them around a couple times, but I thought they just used like the wrong picture or something, because I thought there was no way this small thing could be a hard drive. Overall, it's fantastic. Turning my computer on and being on my desktop in 10 seconds is just hilarious to me. I still remember the first computer I ever got as a kid took like five minutes to get to the desktop. In my research, I found that M.2s can get a little hot, so I decided to buy a pack of copper heat sinks as well to apply to it. Unfortunately, I never took a look at the temperatures before and after, but I've never seen it go above 43 degrees, so I'm pretty happy with that. In addition to that, I bought a one terabyte Samsung 850 Evo 2.5 inch SSD, which is only being used to store all of my games. I had most of my games running on my SSD in my old computer, so I'm not new to the world of SSD loading screens, but that doesn't mean I don't have a little bit of a smirk when my games load lightning quick. To try and help keep my computer cool, I bought two 120mm Noctua NFF 12 fans. They're so ugly, but they're consistently referred to as one of the best fans for both noise and keeping things cool, and I wanted to put them at the bottom of my case anyway, so I didn't think it'd be a big issue. Powering all of this is a Seasonic Focus Plus 850 watt power supply rated 80 plus gold. I was considering getting an 80 plus platinum or titanium but the price difference was just a bit too much for my liking and for what I'll be doing I really don't need anything above gold. Initially I was going to go with an EVGA power supply but people online had mentioned to me that Seasonic is more reliable, cheaper, and quieter than EVGA. Honestly, I had never heard of Seasonic prior to that, and I was a little bit embarrassed to find out that they were in the power supply game since the 80s. And sure enough, all the reviews echoed what everyone online told me. Seasonic is both reliable and makes a pretty damn good power supply, so I went with them. I don't have any complaints, it's a power supply that supplies power good. The only new peripheral I bought was a keyboard. I got a Corsair K95 RGB Platinum mechanical keyboard with Cherry MX Brown switches. I actually had no intention of switching out my old keyboard, but decided last minute that I just wanted a keyboard that fit with the elite feel of my new computer. And my old membrane keyboard with three light options just really wasn't cutting it. And to be honest, especially in WoW, I was noticing that not all of my keystrokes were being registered and it was starting to get really frustrating. I looked through a lot of keyboards and was actually pretty nervous settling on anything just because it's something I'll be using all the time and I need it to be absolutely perfect. And I don't actually remember any of the other keyboards I looked at, but none of them really appealed to me and the reviews always left something to be desired. Even this keyboard at first I didn't like, and the only reason I didn't like it is because the spacebar has these little lines on it and it just has texture. And I didn't want it because I knew that eventually these crevices would fill up with gross stuff and I need to clean my spacebar and I just don't want that. But then I found out you can actually change the keys on a keyboard. You just need to get the right specs on the new one, so suddenly at that point the K95 became a lot more appealing. I like the media keys, that's something that I use all the time and require on a keyboard. The extra macro keys are a nice touch, the RGB looks phenomenal so I decided to stop at my local computer store to take a look. The first thing I did was test all the mechanical switches. They have a little cutout with all the different types so you can see which one you like best. To be honest, I thought the blue was going to be the one I liked the least, but it ended up being the one I liked the most. The browns were my second favorite, which is good because this keyboard only came in browns and speeds. The only downside for the browns is that I think they activate a little bit too quickly. I took this keyboard out of the box in the store, tested it, and I liked it, and I made a decision to buy it. When I first got it, I had a little bit of dislike towards it just because it was different from all the other keyboards I've used in the past. Firstly, the macro keys mess with my muscle memory. Whenever I try to hit escape, 
escape, I was now hitting the first macro key. Going to my default W A S D positioning, now maybe go to Q caps lock A S. What I ended up doing was moving the keyboard a little bit off center to the left. It's as far left as I can go before my natural hand positioning no longer feels natural. This has helped me, especially with my W A S D placement. The other thing too is that the keys are a little bit smaller than what I'm used to, so sometimes I have to stop what I'm doing, look down at my hands, and just see where I am. But the more I use it, the more comfortable I feel with it, and I think that as time goes on, I'll just continue to get more comfortable. I love this keyboard. The RGB looks incredible. I love the sound it makes too. I never thought that mechanical keyboards really sounded all that great, but I'm finding that I get satisfaction out of typing. There's actually been a couple of times where I didn't want to go to bed for the night because I wanted to continue to listen to myself type. For my cable management, I went with some double-sided tape, Velcro straps, twist ties, and a cable racer. I definitely like the look of the racer, especially compared to those cable management baskets or whatever that you can stick underneath your desk. I think those look atrocious. For the lighting, I just bought a 16 and a half foot RGB LED strip off Amazon, and externally powering all of this is a Monster Power Black Platinum 800 surge protector with eight outlets. I was looking for a good power source, and this one was on sale at Best Buy for like 80 bucks, down from its normal 220, I think. I did about 10 minutes of research and decided it was good, and it also looks nice, so that's a plus. So now onto the actual building of the computer. I have pretty clammy hands, so I was nervous was touching anything so I kept wiping them against my pants. I was scared to touch the back of the motherboard when I took it out because I wasn't sure if I'd break anything if I just touched like the bottom of the motherboard. So I left it in the foam and put it on top of the motherboard box and I installed the CPU first. And right away I ran into my first issue which is all the guides set to align the yellow arrow on the CPU with the arrow on the motherboard. But the motherboard has no arrow so in the manual I just saw that it said to put the arrow in the bottom left corner. When I went to close the CPU inside of the motherboard there was a scratching sound that just sounded wrong. I knew there had to be some tension pushing the bar down but that scratching just didn't sit right with me. So I opened it and then tried again and there was only a little bit of scratching but it closed fine after that. I think there was just some misalignment with the screw. My RAM was next and I noticed that it had some weight to it surprisingly. I've put RAM into a motherboard a few times in my life but every time I do it just feels like I apply way too much pressure. Once I put them all in it seemed like the middle sticks were rubbing up against each other so I was a little bit nervous for temperature but after doing benchmarks they seemed to be running fine. After that it was installing the M.2. The motherboard manual said to not put the M.2 in on an angle so I was trying to shove it in as horizontally as I could but it just wasn't working so I took it out and I noticed what looked like a small black scratch on the connectors. I wasn't sure if this was my fault and it was bad or if it was just my fault and there was no problem or it was just a normal thing. But I ended up putting it in on a little bit of an angle and it went in a lot easier. When I pushed it down I realized I didn't even have the screw out of the bag. So I took it out of the slot again because I was scared that if I left it in on an angle it would damage it. But when I got the screw I put it back in and then tried to screw it in with a big screwdriver. This screwdriver however is not magnetic so the screw just fell and I had to take out the M.2 again to get the screw. I went and I got another screwdriver that was magnetic but it was very small and really only worked for these screws. So with this screwdriver I put in the M.2 and I actually thought about stopping here because my heat sinks for the M.2 hadn't come in yet. But I was too excited so I kept going. Putting the shield thing for the motherboard in the back of my case wasn't too difficult. It went in pretty easy but I wasn't sure if one of the corners was fully in. It felt like a bit of it was sticking out a little bit more than the other corners but no amount of pressure I seemed to put on it made it go in further so I just left it. Next was putting the motherboard into the case. The case came with 9 standoffs pre-installed. Initially I thought the standoffs had to actually go through the motherboard and I had a moment of panic when I realized that none of the standoffs would fit through the hole on my motherboard. So I texted my brother asking if they had to go through the hole or if the motherboard just sat on the standoffs. After I sent that text I figured it would make more sense if the motherboard sat on them so I spent a bit of time aligning as best as I could. I realized that the motherboard actually had 10 holes for standoffs so I took out the motherboard and installed the 10th one. I put the motherboard back in and I used the small screwdriver to get the screws in place and then the bigger one to screw them in. It was a bit annoying for the first few screws as I couldn't keep the motherboard in place so aligning it was a bit hard. Whenever the motherboard moved a little bit I was scared that I was scratching something important on the underside of it. But I screwed everything in and then tightened everything and cautiously lifted my case and was happy to see that nothing fell off. Next I figured I would set up the CPU cooler. This actually ended up being the longest part of the build and easily the most irritating. Which is actually kind of funny since I thought this would be pretty quick to install. This actually took so long that I burnt through one and a half batteries on my camera to record it and then I stopped recording because it took so much footage and I was about halfway done at that point. So putting in the backplate was fine. Then I went to add in the standoffs inside the case and ran into my first issue. I didn't read the manual at first so I wasn't sure which screws I was supposed to use and started with the AMD ones. When I realized I was wrong I unscrewed them but wasn't sure if the Intel ones would work since it said it was 
for an LGA 1150 and I have an LGA 1151 socket. I texted my brother to double check, but I figured it was just the 1150 series, kind of like the 1000 series for Nvidia GPUs. So I screwed those in, but they didn't really sit flush with the motherboard and the backplate had a bit of a wiggle back and forth. I didn't know really what to do to remove that wiggle, so I texted my brother again, who also has this CLC and he said it was fine. Now I had to actually add the cooler and this is where it all went downhill. Firstly, I kind of just spaced out and forgot that the Intel mount came pre-installed. So when I was going through all the parts, I only saw the AMD plate and thought they didn't give me the plate I need and was super annoyed. Once I figured that out, I unscrewed the fans from the radiator because I wanted them inside the case with the rad on top. Once I unscrewed the fans, I tried to fit the cooler through one of the holes at the top of my case and realized that it actually wouldn't fit. I asked my brother and tried looking online to see if it was a bad idea to have the radiator inside with the fans on the outside of the case pulling air out of the case. My brother said that the inside of the case may be a little bit warmer, but overall it should be fine. Other than that, I didn't really find what I was looking for online. But then I remembered watching the EVGA tutorial for how to install this and the guy removed the plate. So I removed the mounting plate and tried fitting it through the hole to see if it would fit now. I had to be careful not to scrape the thermal paste on one of the rungs, but it ended up fitting through and I could go with my original plan. Reapplying the mounting plate was a little bit scary. First I mounted it backwards, then I mounted it correctly. Both times I was putting a lot of pressure to lock it into place and I was afraid I was going to snap it. But I locked it in place, mounted it to the CPU, and now it was time for me to get pissed off. I tried for a while to line up the rad so I could screw in at least one screw, but I just couldn't. So I ended up asking my dad to come hold the rad for me. We placed the case on its side so I could see a bit better and screwed in two screws into the first fan. Then I tried the second fan, but I couldn't get the screw I was looking for. I kept trying and trying and trying, and so eventually I unscrewed the other fan screws a bit to make the rad movement easier, but that did nothing. I unscrewed the other fan entirely and tried to get this one working and it just wouldn't. It took me a lot longer than it should have to finally accept the fact that no matter how we position the rad, at least two of the screws on one fan could not be screwed in because half the hole was obstructed by my case. I tried for a very, very long time to try and make it work before I decided I had to shave my case down a bit. It was around this time that the recording stopped. We shaved where the tubes were resting so they could go deeper and thus bring the holes down. It took some trial and error, but we got it to a good enough depth where we could see all the holes. So now it was just a simple matter of screwing everything in, right? Wrong. Even though we could see all the screws, some of them were just not getting caught. We had to loosen the hell out of all the screws and work with the hardest hole to plug and then make our way around. But finally, something like two hours later, the fans were installed and the radiator was done and over with. I figured I'd try putting in my GPU next. I unscrewed the things at the back and aligned it and pushed it in. I've done this a few times in my life and just like the RAM, it always feels way too hard when I push it in. Once I plugged it into my motherboard, I realized that the GPU hung right over my SATA ports. So I took out the GPU and switched my focus to my hard drives. I unplugged two of my spinning this drives from my old computer so I could plug them into this computer. That was kind of annoying because the hard drive bays in my old computer was stuck so I had to pretty much force these things out. I put them into my new computer's bay and then used the new SATA cables I got to plug them in. I realized that my motherboard came only with two right angle SATA cables and the other two were straight cables. It wasn't that big of a deal and I think it probably worked out better this way, but I plugged in the power and the SATA cables. I was hoping the power cable would hang low enough that I could use it for my SSD as well, but I couldn't. With that, it was time to move on to the most intimidating part of the build for me, which was plugging everything into the motherboard into a lesser extent into the power supply. Most of the connections ended up being pretty easy to do, especially since I was referencing my motherboard manual and the labeled picture provided in there. The longest thing here and the most scary for me was the plugs for power, reset, and all that stuff. I think I consulted both my manual and the motherboard itself like 30 times before I plugged in one thing. And I think I just built this up as something very scary in my head, but I knew what I was doing and I knew it was correct, but I just couldn't shake the feeling of nervousness. Then I went to plug in one of the last things I had, which was my CPU fans. And that's when I realized that one of the cables was stuck between the fan and the radiator, and I couldn't get it out unless I started unscrewing stuff. I was pretty annoyed at this, and I tried pulling it through, but it just wouldn't budge. So I started unscrewing the fan a bit, and it made more room, but still not enough. I ended up unscrewing all four screws pretty much all the way, and even then I had to really pull on it to get it free. I really did not want to fully unscrew anything and risk it not going back in. Well, luckily I got it out, I ran it through the back of my case, and plugged it in. I started doing all the power connections, which weren't too difficult to find out. I just made sure that everything that required power was plugged in somewhere on the power supply. Everything was fine until I got to my 24 pin power cable. I plugged it in fine on the motherboard, but for some reason I couldn't figure out where it went on the power supply. I don't know what I did because all the slots I tried initially didn't work, so I was pretty confused. My cable also came with an 8 pin attachment beside the power connection that goes into the power supply, so this made me even more confused. I ended up plugging in the big connection, but I still wasn't sure what the 8 pin was for, and as far as I could tell it didn't fit anywhere, so I thought, okay, it must be for certain types of motherboard boards or power supplies or something, so I didn't plug it in. But for some reason I felt like it had to go somewhere, so I tried again to see if it would fit anywhere. And sure enough it fit, right into the plug beside the big connector. Go figure. 
At this point, I decided to mount my SSD in the back and then had to plug that in. The problem with my SSD was that when mounted, it sits pretty low to the bottom of my case, so plugging in the cables was actually pretty difficult because I had to bend them pretty much 90 degrees right where the plug was to fit them. I was going to unmount the SSD, plug the cables in, and then remount it, but that actually would have been worse as the cables probably would have snapped when I pushed the SSD back into place. So I ended up running the cables through the inside of my case and then out the back instead of them running from the back to the inside like my hard drive cables were. This was the only solution I could find and it's not the one I'm most satisfied with, but it works given the circumstances. And then it was finally time to put in the graphics card, for real this time. Getting it in was fine, but connecting the power was quite not. So my GPU has two 8-pin connectors on it, and the first cable I tried to use wasn't working out that well. The first 8-pin connector went in fine, but the second one just couldn't reach all the way, so it was halfway plugged in. So I decided to try my luck with a different power connector. Sure enough, that one worked just fine. It wasn't as stiff, which is, I guess, all that I needed. Moving on, it was time for the last bit of hardware to get installed, which were my two ugly Noctua case fans. I had no idea which way to orient the fans so that they pulled air into my case, so after spinning the fans with my finger and trying to figure it out, I decided I'd just mount them in each way and then change the wrong one once I got my computer up and running. I immediately came across an issue. The original placement I had intended for the fans which was closer to the front of the case was not going to work. Reason being, those SSD cables that I said I tried to hide away as best as I could, those were actually slightly in the way of one of the fans. I could force them back and screw the fan in anyway, but I just didn't like the idea of so much pressure being on the cable and potentially ripping out of my SSD or just breaking. So I decided to mount them as close to the power supply as I could. It's not that big of a deal, it was mostly an aesthetic decision for me to have them closer to the front initially. So I screwed them into this new position, and after screwing one in, I realized that the way I was going about it would have made the cables much more noticeable. So I unscrewed it, reoriented, and then screwed them both in correctly. And with that, it was a moment of truth, it was time to see if it would turn on, and it certainly did not. There's no feeling quite like going to turn your computer on for the first time, and then nothing happening. It's like you promised yourself you're going to Disney World, and then just went to the dentist instead. I made sure everything was plugged in, I double checked the power switch, I even changed the power cable that ran into the wall, and all signs pointed to it should work. My immediate fear was that my sweaty hands ruined a component, so I called my brother and one of the questions he asked me had to do with my CPU power cable. He asked how it was plugged into my motherboard. I told him there was a 4 pin and another 4 pin plugged into the motherboard. He told me to unplug one of the 4 pins and try again. Sure enough, that was exactly what it was. I'd even spoken with him earlier and he told me not to plug in both 4 pins. I remember thinking, but it's power, so I'll just plug in both 4 pins. I should not have plugged in both 4 pins. As soon as I plugged in the power cable back into my computer, the lights came on inside and a smile came across my face because in that moment, I knew that I had pretty much built my computer. I took a few seconds to admire the pretty colors and then hit the power button. And then it just kept powering on and off with nothing showing on my screen. Damn, I thought. So close. I took this opportunity to quickly check my Noctua fans to figure out which one was blowing into the case and made note of it so I could change it later. I also noticed my two front fans were not working. So I'm a rook when it comes to all this and I don't know what to do, so I call my brother, of course. My computer's not showing anything on the screen, it's not beeping, I don't know how to proceed. I mentioned that my motherboard has two digit codes showing up on it very quickly and I'm guessing they're error codes. I start reading them off, but they change so fast I'm falling behind. He pulls one of the codes up on Google and suggests I take out two of my memory sticks and try again. As for the fans, he suggests I plug them into the mold connector because that may be the issue. So I take out two of my memory sticks, boot up, and it works! My brother said to get the BIOS update and then try again with all the RAM in. So I spent the rest of the night getting all my drivers, updating my BIOS, which by the way made it so I could use all four RAM sticks, so that was cool. The Molex ended up being the fix for my fans too. All the cables for the front I.O. were all tied together and they seemed to just go off into a uh, into abyss it looked like, so I had no idea that that was a connector for my fans. I was looking for a case fan connector the entire time. I even thought that when I disconnected the top fan to mount my radiator, I may have broken something. But nope, the Molex connector fixed the issue and that was it. My computer was up and it was running. I went to bed at like 1 a.m. and woke up four hours later for work. Totally worth it. I came home the next day and finished updating and installing everything I needed. I didn't record anything on this day, but I ran some benchmarks just to do some tests on the stock hardware. I was just looking to see if it crashed on me or if there was any issues that I ran into, but it all went well and I was pretty happy about that. Also on this day came my M.2 heatsinks. They're smaller than a penny, which for some reason surprised me, even though I know the size of an M.2. I opted for these as opposed to full encasing heatsinks, just because I don't think those reduce the heat that well and they kind of sketch me out. I also realized that I'm pretty bad at counting because I didn't have enough USB ports on my motherboard to connect all my stuff. I was missing missing two ports. Initially I was going to buy an external USB hub. I wasn't too thrilled about this because the one I was getting was bulky and I was going to have to find a way to make it look nice or tape it onto my case. However, I brought it up to my all-knowing brother who suggested I just get a PCIe USB card, and that I did. It ended up arriving later that week well after I had settled into my computer. Plugging it in wasn't that big of a deal. The only thing I didn't like is that the SATA power cable runs pretty much across my entire case. You can't really see it because it's underneath my GPU, but if you look closely you'll see it. While I was plugging this in, I also plugged in something I forgot to plug in. The USB 
speed of my CPU cooler so I can play with the lighting and monitor the fans and temperatures through EVGA software. Going back to the day after I built my computer though, I was really excited because my RGB light strip had also come in. It actually ended up being the perfect length to go around my entire desk, I only cut off like a foot at the end. Getting it underneath my desk was a little bit of a pain, just because once you took off the protection for the adhesive and placed it down, trying to mold the way it flows around my desk is pretty difficult. The reviews did mention that the adhesive on the strip wasn't that great, so I wasn't surprised to see it was not sticking in all parts. It was kind of annoying, but I do have double-sided tape just for this. So I got it all set up and I had to use a bit more double-sided tape than I would have liked. And even with the double-sided tape, the way that some of the strip has to conform to my desk is making it not stick at all. So especially on the one side of my desk, it kind of just hangs there. Right now I've got a couch hiding it, so it's not that big of a deal, but I'll probably need to find a more permanent solution to that eventually. I've been wanting to get the lighting strip to go around my desk for over a year now, and I'm really glad I did it. It looks fantastic. I only have two complaints though. Firstly, when the colors fade from red to orange, it's a very noticeable change. It almost looks like it turns off for a second and then back on. I don't really notice it if I'm focused, but if I'm just browsing the internet, I can definitely see it out of the corner of my eye. The second complaint is just something I wish I did differently. The back of my monitors are still dark. I wish I put the strip on the side of my desk instead of underneath it. I may redo it in the future, but for now it's totally fine. At this point, I was almost done. I had only one thing left to do for my computer, which was to cable manage the outside. I cut the racer down to the length of my desk. I actually ended up using probably 85% of it, which is great. I used up a lot of my double-sided tape getting this underneath my desk, as well as on my surge protector. For some reason, I make really dumb decisions sometimes. I actually forgot the point of a cable management racer. I put the cover on it and started running cables through it. I got about three cables in before it became impossible to thread stuff through. I tried my hardest, but in the end, it just didn't work. So I took off the cover and out loud said to myself, screw it, I, I'll just run the cables through all the little cracks and then put the cover on and I think it'll hold. Yep. Out loud, I said to myself the correct way to use a racer, but still for a moment thought I was being crafty. Again, I got about three cables in before I burst out laughing because I realized what I was doing was the correct way to run cables through this thing. Once I figured that out, I put on Bill Burr's latest podcast episode and spent about an hour getting it all organized. I'll be honest, prior to this moment, I really didn't care about cable management. My thought was, who cares? They're just cables. It doesn't look that bad. And even when I bought the cable management stuff, I didn't really care all that much. My opinion swayed a bit. I thought, yeah, if I spend a lot of time here, why not just make it look nicer? Having cables everywhere, I guess, is kind of ugly. But it wasn't until I saw the finished product with only one visible cable that I truly appreciated cable management. I am never going to let wires just hang down ever again. It's so nice being able to now extend my legs and not have to do it slowly in fear of catching a bunch of cables and pulling on them. With everything now done, it was time to clean up. I'd made quite the mess and I wasn't cleaning up as I was building my computer, so I had a bunch of crap scattered around my room. So bit by bit, I started throwing things away, putting things away, using my twist ties on cables I was storing away. It took about an hour to get it all cleaned up and it was nice when it was done because I really hate having a room that cluttered. The last thing I had to put away was my old computer. I'm keeping it to play around with or currently use as like a Netflix machine or in case I ever run into problems with this new computer and just need a spare part. This might be a little weird to some people but I have this habit of forming a connection with inanimate objects and I find them hard to get rid of especially if they have some sort of sentimental value to me. To add to the weirdness I had a heart to heart with my old computer. There was a lot of times especially in 2017 where it seemed to really frustrate me and had a bunch of dying parts but despite that it was my first real computer and I've had it since like 2011 I 2012 maybe and I essentially went down memory lane and recalled some fun memories I had with it while playing on it. I thanked it for being the soldier it ended up being for me and bringing me thousands of hours of entertainment. I thanked it for helping me get through my lowest points and being there when I felt like I was king of the world. And yes, I even gave it a kiss goodnight before I put it away, but I ended up taking it out of retirement like two weeks later so I could use it as a test PC. I spent the remainder of the week enjoying my computer and making sure it was also holding up in games, which it was fantastically. So I decided that I would, for the first time in my life, try overclocking. I started with my CPU because it was the component I was the most nervous for seeing as I could actually kill it if I mess it up. I spent a while going through my UEFI menus looking for somewhere to change my core clock and my voltage. I found core frequency which when updated changed the speed of my CPU so I figured that was core clock but voltage I couldn't find anywhere even though there was a voltage section. It just wasn't labeled anything close to what I've been seeing in numerous guides. So a little bit nervous I decided to start by using the pre-installed overclock as Rock does. I brought it up to 4.6 gigahertz. I just wanted to see what values in the menu were changing because the videos I had watched said that factory overclocks may be good but they also may drastically increase your voltage for no reason. When I applied the change, I saw that I was right, the core frequency is what I'm supposed to be changing. So I started playing around with that with a stock voltage since I couldn't find it. I ended up getting to 5 GHz without changing my voltage, which was kind of shocking because I figured by then I'd need to. At this point, I decided I should actually figure out this whole voltage thing. As I said earlier in the video, there's actually no way to manually set the voltage, so I had to figure out how to use offset. It wasn't too hard to figure out, and once I did the 5 GHz overclock, once I was starting to change my voltages, was showing instabilities, which sucked. I would have loved to keep it at 5 and just lower the voltage so the temperatures went down, but it was sitting in the high 70s 
mid 80s sometimes under load and I just wasn't really comfortable with that. So I dialed it back to 4.9 gigahertz with a 3.8 gigahertz memory cache. I played with the voltage offset and found that negative 70 was the sweet spot where I could run all my benchmarks and keep the temperatures low. The highest temperature I got was 72 degrees celsius under load which I was fine with and I was sitting around 30 at idle. I played with this for probably close to two hours before settling on these values. Finding the perfect values to get perfect results was just a bunch of fun. Seeing my benchmarks get better was also really cool. Unfortunately after a few days at 4.9 my system started to crash randomly. Randomly. I decided not to do anything besides change my core clock to 4.8 gigahertz and since then I haven't had any issues and my temperatures are about the same. So now moving on to my GPU where I was a lot more comfortable and it was much easier to do and much harder to screw up. Using Afterburner I ran Unigen Valley and started increasing my values. I kept increasing stuff until Valley froze which I later realized is the wrong way to look for instability. I added about 800 megahertz before I started paying attention to Valley which was riddled with artifacts which then reminded me why I'm not supposed to just wait for Valley to freeze. So I ended up adding 50 megahertz megahertz of the core clock which brings me to a total of 2012 megahertz. For the memory clock I added 350 megahertz which brings me to a total of 5858 megahertz. I did have higher values here but when I was recording my benchmarks for this video actually I realized that there was still some instabilities so I redid all of my overclocking and these are the final values that worked for me. I don't think that's terrible but I think that some people got much higher than I did. In my benchmarks I was gaining anywhere from 10 to 60 fps which was awesome. Getting 360 fps versus 300 is stupid but I like being able to say that. Through all my benchmarks and all of my gaming sessions, the hottest the card has ever gotten has been the low 70s, which is fantastic, and I'm very pleased with that. So now with all that done, I thought I'd give a room tour because I'm really happy with how everything is looking. You'll notice a common theme with my room, starting with the door, which has a Toronto Maple Leafs parking only sign on it. When you walk in on the right is my TV. It's a Samsung, and I don't really know how big it is. My brother bought it when Battlefield 4 came out so he could play it on my Xbox. He tried to pawn off the payments on me, but since I didn't really want a new TV, he just kept paying for it, and now it's mine. Thanks, bro. Above it is a Hobbit poster for the the first movie. The Hobbit was a book I read a lot back in the day and when they announced that it was becoming a movie I couldn't believe it. The stand thing I have for the TV I like a lot. I bought it at Walmart for like a hundred dollars or something. It's mostly black glass though so the dust can get pretty ridiculous sometimes. On top of that I have my pops. My Team Fortress 2 guys lined up like they're going to take a flag. My Portal 2 guys who are all grouped up together and laughing at a fallen over turret. One of the turret's legs is actually shorter than the other so I can't get it to stand up anymore so that's the story I've made here. Then I've got my Mitchum Marner and Austin Matthews pops along with my Austin Matthews Pepsi can. Very thematic. Below that I've got an original Super Nintendo, two controllers, Mortal Kombat 1, 2, Donkey Kong Country, and Super Mario World. I remember spending a lot of time on eBay trying to pick parts that didn't have that ugly yellow tint on them. And then when these came in I took apart everything and cleaned it extensively with a cotton swab. Over beside that I have my mini Super Nintendo. Luckily I had a two-week vacation near the end of last year so I was able to drive around in the early morning and pick up a couple of these. Beside that is my Steam Link that I got when they were on sale for like five bucks last year. I'm not really happy with it actually. Both the wired and wireless connections have crazy input lag so it's impossible to enjoy a game on this. Below that I've got my movie collection. In the middle I've got my Xbox games. Then over to the right I've got my Xbox 360 which I got back in high school and I've spent probably less than 50 collective hours gaming on. On the wall beside this I've got the Kramer. I got it for Christmas last year and I absolutely love it. I'm a big fan of Seinfeld. Below that is my old computer which is now my video streaming computer and will hopefully become my test computer in the near future. My uncomfortable couch which I one day hope to replace with something that isn't awful. I've obviously got my Maple Leafs pillow which my mom bought for me. On the wall near the entrance I've got my second oldest poster which is a Steel Panther poster from a tour promoting their first album. I actually didn't go to this show my brother did and he brought home like 10 of these posters so I just took one. Beside that is my oldest poster which is looking pretty rough nowadays. It's my Slipknot 9.0 live poster. I think my brother also gave me this when the album came out. On the other wall beside that I've got the Costanza. I've got a moon chair or whatever these are called and it's pretty uncomfortable. An acoustic guitar my dad bought for me for my birthday once because I'd been playing a bit of a guitar around that time. I don't play it often and I'm not very good but it's just fun to mess around with sometimes. This is my printer that just recently stopped working so I'm still trying to fix that. Above it is another Slipknot poster I got from the mall during their 0.5 album cycle. On the wall beside it, I've got a nice big whiteboard that I've used for a lot of stuff in the past. It started off as a board I used to write out my work and YouTube video schedule back when I was posting a video every day. Nowadays, I use it to write out the Maple Leaf schedule. I got it on my birthday a couple years ago. On the ground below it is where I keep my Astro A50 wireless headset. I don't really have another good spot for it, and this is one that's been working for about three years now. The A50s are great. The battery life is about six to eight hours, which is fine. I bought a longer USB cable to plug it into when the battery is low. Before I go to my desk, I just want to quickly bring up a few more things I've got on the support beam wall. I've got a CM Punk painting a friend of mine made for me back in college. I'm a big wrestling fan and Punk was one of my favorites. In the middle I've got a signed picture from Corey Taylor's first book Seven Deadly Sins. I think I remember reading that there was only 500 of these and they were put into random packages when the book came out, but I don't know for sure if that's true. And then beside that I've got a Maple Leafs painting from the same friend also made for me back in college. 
So then moving on to the workstation, obviously I've got my computer. Unfortunately, this is the best place for me to put it right now. So you can't really see the lighting inside of it. This desk I got from either Ikea or Staples over 10 years ago. My external hard drive, it's three terabytes and it stores all my pictures, music, some movies, apps, and just other stuff. I back this up at least every other month. I'm one of those people who lost everything when one of my hard drives died on me, so now I'm super paranoid about losing stuff. I have three monitors now. My side monitors are just spare monitors we've had around, nothing special. The left one is an Acer X223W. The right one is a Dell 2009W. My middle monitor is an Asus VG278HE, running at 144Hz. This monitor was a pain in the ass. I went to my local computer shop to buy it like 5 years ago. A lot of the reviews mentioned it had problems with dead pixels, and I had to return 3 monitors in one day before I got this one that did not have any dead pixels. But I remember when I got it, and still to this day, the 144Hz screen blows me away. I can definitely see the difference between 60Hz, and I don't think I can actually play on a 60Hz monitor anymore. I've got some Logitech speakers that I think are even older than my desk. There's actually five speakers, but on my old computer, the back two and the middle one didn't work. I never tried them on my new computer, but I really like the look of three speakers a lot more. The middle one isn't plugged in, I just used it as a phone stand. My Walmart clock, I have this thing about easily knowing what time it is at any given moment. My 2018 Leafs calendar I got for Christmas. My boom arm, which is from Rode, but I don't remember the model. This thing is fantastic. The mic I use is a blue snowball. It's not the greatest, but with a couple seconds of editing and audacity, it sounds fine. The pop filter is a Natty MPF6. It was like 20 bucks on Amazon and it works great. My long mouse pad, a Parix DX2000 with my TT Esports there on mouse, which I like. The only thing I don't like about my mouse is that the middle button feels weird if I click it near the front of the mouse. And then of course my beautiful keyboard. Next to that, I've got an Xbox One, which was the first expensive purchase I ever made with money I made from YouTube. I got it to play Halo 5 when it came out. Above my desk, I've got a few books. I love reading autobiographies or books written by people I like. My top three in no particular order are Professional Idiot by Stevo, You're Making Me Hate You by Corey Taylor, and The Long Hard Road Out of Hell by Marilyn Manson. Next to that, I've got a Buddha statue that my dad brought me back from Poland. I'm not sure why he got me this, but I thought it looked cool, so I kept it. The sword they have used to hang off my old car's rear view mirror, but since my new car can't hold it, I set it here. A Rubik's Cube, which I learned how to do from YouTube videos. Behind that, I've got my Half-Life 2 Collector's Edition box. My brother bought this back when the game came out, and Half-Life is one of my favorite games, so this box is really special to me. The inside just holds old games and CD cases like the original Counter-Strike, Team Fortress, and Opposing Force. Beside that, I've got a small collection of physical copies of games. I used to have a lot more, but I got rid of a lot of them. Day of Defeat, I remember buying after a free weekend like 13 years ago or something like that. My mom didn't know it was a violent game, and she just let me buy it. Half-Life 2 Episode 1, of course. TF2, I bought a few months after the game came out, I think. I can't get rid of this now, especially since TF2 has been free to play for years. Then I've got my WoW boxes from Vanilla to Cataclysm. I stopped buying the physical copies after Cata. Next to my games, I've got a small collection of pop bottles. I don't drink pop very often, but I just love the way the bottles look. The Coke bottles are what started this all. Jones bottles I've always really liked because of the images they have on them, plus they just, I don't know, they look cool. And then these Jaritos just look cool. On my windowsill, I've got a couple Canadian flags. I want to find a couple Polish and Toronto Maple Leaf flags to stick in here eventually. And that's it. That's a journey I took to start the new year and it was a blast. Building computers is a bunch of fun. Being able to experience 144 FPS ultra quality graphics again is fantastic. Especially in a game like Battlefield which just looks amazing. Or getting 300 frames per second in Gary's mod is absolutely ridiculous. It honestly looks more smooth than real life. Or the fact that I can get 80 FPS in WoW with all my graphics turned up while doing a raid boss. I didn't even know that was possible. Having a computer that can actually run Windows 10 without blue screening immediately is pretty cool. Finally being able to use my third monitor is so nice and handy and the fact that i can plug in my tv with my hdmi and use it as a fourth monitor without any problems if i wanted to is hilarious overall i have no buyer's remorse with any of my purchases except for maybe my ram because i really want that rgb but everything runs fantastically and i could not be happier all the rgb stuff looks great i just said it all to fluidly change between colors because i like having a mishmash of the rainbow but anyway that's it thanks for watching this was a bunch of fun for me to both make my computer and make this video and i hope it was fun for you to watch if you're building a computer best of luck to you it is a bunch of fun definitely take some time to watch some youtube videos on how to build a computer and maybe read some guides as well but yeah otherwise i'll see you around have a good day